He is risen. Oh, that was, that was, we'll try again in just a moment. I, I love that. I really do. Uh, as a kid, I sort of despised it to make confession. But uh, the Lord has grown me in uh, the significance of Christ's death and resurrection and its precious and wonderful proclamation because of what Romans 4.25 says. He was delivered over because of our transgressions and raised because of our justification. So in that little simple statement, it, it's an affirmation um, that we were delivered, that Christ was delivered over for our sin, and that because of his resurrection, we have justification. So it is a precious proclamation, and I'm going to let you go at it one more time, just so we get it right. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. I have no doubt that some of you have heard uh, many sermons on the proofs of the resurrection, it, that it is a historical reality. Indeed, it is, and there are ample proofs of it. Within the historical documents of the Gospels, we can see that there are dozens of proofs of the resurrection. Every eyewitness, believer and unbeliever alike, says that Jesus died. He did not faint nor pass out. Furthermore, all of these eyewitnesses, believer and unbeliever, claim that he really was buried and not just hidden somewhere by the disciples. And they do claim that he all did rise from the dead, even if they had to make up a lie. His body was not in the tomb anymore on sunrise of Sunday morning. And there are, as we saw from 1 Corinthians, over 500 witnesses to his resurrected life and body. All of this is plenty of convincing proof for anyone who is genuinely seeking to be convinced. And much more has been written on proving Jesus' resurrection. Men like Josh McDowell, men like Lee Strobel, many other men and women have spent much of their lives working and proving the historical reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus. It has been proven. And yet, in all this preaching on the proof of the resurrection, I have to wonder if we've forgotten uh, to cover in a sort of adequate way what does the resurrection prove? And that's what I'd like to address this evening. And there's probably many texts that we could go to to answer this question, most notably, as Andrew read for us, 1 Corinthians 15, which is the longest section of all of Paul's writings, and it is the, the epitome of, of the importance of the resurrection of Christ. It would actually be worth your time uh, before you go to bed tonight, to read all of 1 Corinthians 15 in one shot as a whole chapter to remember the importance of the resurrection, or maybe even spend time this week in just the sections within chapter 15 and, and marvel at what God has accomplished uh, with the resurrection of Jesus. But I'm not going to that text. As I told you, we are in Acts 17. Here we have something else that is significant that the resurrection proves. And I think it's really important for us to remember what's found here, and it is simply this. The resurrection of Jesus proves that God will one day judge the world in righteousness, in which Jesus is that judge. Therefore, repent. This is the time to repent and believe. That's what this text that's what the resurrection is proving, and I'll show you that in our text tonight. Let me pray, and then we will uh, look at the background, get our context, get our bearings, and then we'll head off into the text. O oh Christ, you are our resurrection and life. Your death provides forgiveness. Your resurrection provides eternal life. Thank you for your eternal gift that comes only by your death and resurrection, and by your grace through our faith. And now, our God, grant us understanding of this text before us. This is your word. 
And we want to understand it as you have given. Our hearts are ready to receive it, plant it, cultivate it, cause the growth for your glory. Amen. Well, the context to this is obviously the first bit of chapter 17. We're going to be in 22 through 34. But the context is the beginning of chapter 17. The Apostle Paul is on his second missionary journey about the early 50s A.D., And he was with Timothy and Silas in Thessalonica, which is north in Greece. Then they came down to Berea, but then were separated for a time. And Paul ends up in the southern part of Greece in the capital known as Athens. You can see in verse uh, 16, we have our immediate context. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing a city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. He also, and also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? And others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him, Paul, and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you're proclaiming? For you're bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Athens was the headquarters of Greek culture. Every form of philosophy and theology and mythology was given a voice in this city. In fact, verse 21 there tells us that many people just found it fun to sit around and just listen to something new or something novel, sort of how people do today when they just kind of browse through podcasts. In fact, the most popular podcast uh, in which is one in which the host interviews a wide array of guests from conservative to liberal, all religious views, business people, scientists, and on and on it goes, just to give every single person a voice. It's, it's a popular thing to do because it's, there's still a desire within us to hear everything. Well, that's what was going on in Athens in the first century, It's just the medium has changed now for us, but nothing has really changed. We want to hear new stuff. That somehow tickles our ears. And here comes Paul talking about, to them, is new, Jesus and the resurrection, verse 18. And they're confused by it because it's a message they have not heard before, which I find just on the surface very interesting. Here you have people who... All they do is sit around and talk about whatever comes into their minds or whatever people want to talk about. But when they hear this, they're confused by it. Verse 18, this, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities. These people are weird. This dude is odd. I mean, they had no problem with other philosophies, and other theologies, but this particular one, Jesus and the resurrection, is way on the weirdo scale, which again, I think is just part of God's plan. It's so left field in the human mind because it is something that the human mind would never conceive, which is Again, this, the scripture's clear about this, that it's impossible then to believe this unless God opens our eyes to believe us. That's what scripture says. God uh, it not only holds the truth, but he's also the giver of that insight. All any of us can do is cry out to him for the gift of faith. So what do they do with this odd teaching that is given by Paul? Well, they take Paul to the epicenter of philosophy in Athens, and that is the Areopagus, also known as Mars Hill. Here is a council of men who met together to investigate things spiritual and philosophical. They were the ones that were holding for everybody 
the status quo and said what was acceptable to normal, uh, the normal uh, Greek culture. All ideas basically had to go through them. Paul is now preaching strange things to these people in the streets, and so he was brought before this council to get a hearing with these experts to find out if what he's preaching is acceptable teaching in Greek life. For Paul, this is just another God-given opportunity to preach the gospel, and that's exactly what he does. And where he lands this presentation in verse 30, excuse me, in verse 31 is the resurrection of Jesus because the resurrection of Jesus proves something about God and then invites us to action. It calls us to respond. Now, in order to get to that, what the resurrection proves, Paul must begin with the character of God, who God is, why he brought, even brought about the resurrection in the first place, And so he goes all the way back to the beginning and makes note of the most basic characteristic of who God is. And this is your outline now. God is our creator. That's where Paul begins. Verse 22, you can look at it in your Bibles. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So again, you'll remember that the Greek Roman culture was polytheistic. They worshiped many gods and goddesses, and they would create icons of these gods in some form of wood or stone or paintings, they would then worship and pray to those things that they had created. And because of polytheism, they further believed that all the gods had not yet been discovered. So as so then not to offend any of those gods that somehow either haven't revealed themselves or they hadn't figured out, after all, this unknown God who they don't know could be really important to us. Uh, They made an altar to this God, this object of worship, and labeled it to an unknown God. Very honoring. (laughs) Well, Paul seized upon this, and the way to discuss the one true God that was actually, in fact, unknown to them, he begins by telling them that this unknown God is the creator of, of all verse 24 the god who made the world and all these and all the things in it since he is lord of heaven and earth does not dwell in temples made with hands nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. Here Paul gets right at it. Paul is not some, Paul's saying that God is not some garden variety, plain Jane, ordinary deity. He is the creator the sovereign over all the universe, the Lord of all. He made it all. He owns it all, and he controls it all. He controls every bit of its movement. And I love this, Um, not because it's novel, because it's not. This isn't an innovative way to go about preaching the gospel. Paul just begins where the Bible begins, that God is the creator of all. And when Paul says that God is creator of all, he's really pointing out three obvious qualities about God. First, that God existed before the world. After all, how can you make something that doesn't exist unless you live before its existence? God must be, as Thomas Aquinas put it back in the 13th century, the first cause. 
This first cause argument was first suggested by Aristotle back in the 300s BC. And this first cause argument says that the world cannot exist on its own. There must be a cause because there cannot be an endless series of causes. Something intelligent had to start it all. Aristotle called this the prime mover, while Thomas Aquinas, who was a Christian, called it the uncaused cause, which he concluded was the God of the Bible. And that is what Paul is getting at with these philosophers 1,300 years before Thomas Aquinas. God is the first cause of all things because he's the creator. And this would be consistent with what the Bible says about God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is to say, at the beginning of the universe, God already existed and thus transcends the universe. John 1.1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus here is the one that's called the Word, and he is at the beginning of all things, meaning he existed before the beginning. In fact, that is what John 1, 3 actually goes on to claim about him, which says, all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by God. Psalm 8 calls all of creation the work of God's fingers. And Psalm 104, he established the earth on its foundations. So he existed before. Secondly, he made all that was made. God did not take something that already existed and then make something from it. Rather, he created ex nihilo, which is Latin for out of nothing. Again, Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In order to have uh, existence, you have to have three things, time, space, and matter. And all three are present in this verse. Time, in the beginning, space, God created the heavens, and matter, God created the earth. The point is, God is the creator of the time, space, matter, universe in which we live. And again, that's exactly what scripture affirms as well. Romans 4, 17, God calls into being that which does not exist Hebrews 11.3 again, by faith we understand the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. So God existed before the world. He made all that was made. And thirdly, this, if he's the creator, it means he's omnipotent. He's omnipotent. Omnipotence literally means all-powerful. But the meaning of using this with God is to say that he has the ability to do whatever he chooses to do. And if you need proof of that, he created everything that you see and know. You and I cannot do that. We cannot create something because we want to. We cannot make, take nothing and make everything. But God did exactly that, making him omnipotent. And again, Scripture confirms this omnipotence of God. Job 42, 2, no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Jeremiah 32, 27, behold, I am Yahweh, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Psalm 115.3, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Isaiah 14, Yahweh of hosts has sworn, saying, surely just as I have intended, so it has happened. And just as I have planned it, so it will stand. For the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? Isaiah 46.10, says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Daniel 4.35, all the inhabitants of the earth 
are counted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand and say to him, what have you done? Luke 1.37, the angel says to Mary, for nothing is impossible with God. Now, aside from those three things, and this brings us back to the text and what Paul's talking about here, Paul points out that because God is the creator, there's three other realities that he points out right here. You could see them beginning with number four, that God is the ruler of all. He's also independent and he's also providential. And I'll work through all those very briefly. First, he's ruler of all. Verse 24, since he is Lord of heaven and earth. I mean, it's natural to assume that a person who created something is its owner and therefore is its ruler. If I take a block of wood and create something from it, it's mine, unless I give it away or sell it. It's assumed that what I make is mine, that I am the owner. Well, God is the, the creator of this universe, Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and all those who dwell in it. Therefore, as the creator, he is the rightful ruler and owner of all his creation. Psalm 103, 19, Yahweh has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty, and here talking about his rulership, it rules over all. In other words, the planets, the stars, the people, the land, the seas, everything that exists in this universe belongs to God. We, in actuality, are nothing unless God gives us everything we are or have. Even our very breath is owned by God and given to us. And we saw that uh, in verse 25. He himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. This tells us that God is not just simply a watchmaker who made the universe, wound it up, and then lets it go to its own making. No, God made the world, and he now rules it. He owns it. It's his, and he is Lord of it, and he will do as he pleases. Paul continues that since God is the creator, it also means that he is independent, that he does not dwell, into verse 24, in temples made of hands. He's not served by human hands, although as if he needed something, then he's the one who gives life and breath and all things. Since God was before all things and he created everything, it would be absurd to even suggest or imagine that God would need his creation to do something for him. In other words, he didn't create uh, for the purpose of seeking more power or because he was lonely or because he was missing something. No, none of that. God is perfectly sufficient, not depending on anything outside of himself for anything and is therefore eternal. He's the foundational being of everything. He is the source of life and the source of substance for everything he created. Theologians like to use the term aseity for this characteristic of God. It's from two Latin words, a, from, and se, meaning self, so from self. And all this means is that God cannot be bought off. And, and this is important in this particular context because unlike, he is unlike the Greek and Roman gods that could be bought off. They could be influenced by humanity if humanity would build them temples or hold festivals in their honor or pay tribute with gold and statues. They could be manipulated to do what people wanted because they were dependent on the people to worship them. But that is not true of the one true God. He has need of nothing while all of his creation has all need of him. Psalm 50, every beast of the forest is mine. 
the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all it contains. I love that imagery. Because even if God needed something, and he doesn't, but if he did, he wouldn't ask anybody for it. He would just go get it because the world belongs to him. If you get a chance, read Psalm 104 sometime. It's a masterpiece on, of writing about how God sustains the world by giving food and water to all of his creatures. Every beast, every wild goat, every lion, every water animal, even humanity owns their sustained living to God and everything relies upon God for their life, proving again he is independent and every bit of his creation is dependent on him. Finally, Paul points out that because God is the creator, he is also providential. Verse 26, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. <laughs> Paul is already at this point already blown up every Greek philosophy uh, that exists. And now he goes for one final one, and that is that God created all people from one man and determines where they live. You see, the Greeks divided the people in the world up into two classes, Greeks and barbarians. Interestingly, the Jews did the same, Jews and Gentiles. But what Paul is saying is that there is not a division in humanity, but there is only one class of people, only one race, the human race, because we all came from the same parents. You see, race is not a concept in the Bible, even though it is a cultural norm in our day. And this is not the time to go into it, but you have to understand the concept of race never appears in the Bible. Skin colors, what we have come to accept as races, was actually developed by evil men who denied the Bible, men like Darwin and Huxley, who were trying to rationalize their own white racism. And yet the Bible, to the Bible, skin color and other characteristics are spoken of purely as nationalities, and then, of course, according to science, it's just a recombination of innate genetic factors. But we're all still one race. And that's great news because it means that no person or nation is superior to the other one. No one can say that they are superior in value and therefore legitimately subject another human to some, to some inferiority. God made all humanity. He made them all out of one set of parents, and he's given life to all of them and their breath. And not only that, God is the one who rules over when we live, when we die, where we move, when we move, how much we own. God orchestrates everything. I was born in Colorado. I graduated high school in Arizona. I went to college in Chicago. I got married in 2007. Uh, we lived in Virginia for two years before moving to Southern California for five years. And now we've lived in Arkansas for almost 10. Why? Because God determined it would be so. God set the boundary and the time of my life just like he's done that with yours. This is what God does. This is who he is. You can even think of the most tragic thing, and yet God works it out just right in every situation that it works out perfectly. For example, in the book of Acts, the church, earlier in the book of Acts, in the church is sort of humming along just fine early on, but then persecution comes, and it really begins to peak right at chapter 7 when Stephen is martyred. It's horrific to kill somebody for proclaiming the gospel. 
And yet God's sovereign over all of that as well. Because the very next chapter, the very next verse actually, Acts 8.1 tells us, on that day, the day that Stephen was killed, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they, that is the church, were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, which sounds terrible. But what happened when all these Christians were scattered? Verse 4 of Acts 8, Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. A horrible, wicked thing indeed has happened. People are displaced and moved, and yet God has not sacrificed his ruling and lordship. He has foreknown that day, and he has made it for the purpose of spreading the gospel further. You see, what men, evil men, devised in the killing of Stephen, that is to shut this thing down called Christianity, actually accelerated the plan by God's design. And this is how God's ruling works, how he is the creator. He has providentially planned all things, working in all ways with all things and by all people. Nobody can run from God's plan, believer or un. You can even take the most powerful people who exist uh, throughout the world, now and in history, and God is still determining it all. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of Yahweh. He turns it wherever he wishes. Isaiah 40, behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket. All the nations are as nothing before God. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. Meaning all their decisions they make doesn't mean anything in the plan of God. Because Psalm 135, 6, whatever Yahweh pleases, he does in heaven and on earth. So here's where Paul begins. God is the creator. Everything that exists, including us puny little humans, has been made by God, continues his existence because of God, and therefore God owns, rules, and determines it all. And yet Paul doesn't stop there. That's not where his sermon ends. He continues on to say that God is not just some super powerful deity in the heavens, but there is a relational element to God. And here we find out in verses 27 through 29 that God is our Father. Because He's our Creator, He's our Father. Look at the text, verse 27. That they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for Him and find Him, though He's not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are His children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Everything has a purpose. That's it's not just some punchline or just some cheesy bumper sticker logo that's used to help the weak-minded. God has made all of life for a singular purpose. Why did God create you? Why do you exist? Verse 27, that you would seek and find God. That is your purpose. Do you understand that? That is why God created you. That is why God puts you in the situation that you're in. Why he gave you your job, why he gave you your parents, why he gave you the college or the home or whatever your, wherever your living situation is, your purpose in life, the person that sits next to you on the plane, the person who's in the other cubicle, the person that you order your meal from, your relatives, those maybe you don't like very much. The point of your existence is for you to seek and find the one true God. But not just to seek him as a lifeless deity 
or something that is made after the imagination of somebody. No, you are to know him as a father, as someone who has created and cares for you. Child of God is a, is a term that is primarily reserved for Christians, for true believers who have repented from their sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. And, and it is a proper title for them as scripture reveals that believers are the special children of God adopted into his family where Jesus is their brother. However, this term, child of God, can also apply to all humanity in a, a very broad sense, in a creation type sense. Just like your father who created you, that is, you are his offspring, you are then a child of his. You are his creation, his offspring, therefore his child by creation. And Paul could have taken all kinds of scriptures and proven this. The Old Testament talks about this as well. But instead, he decides to appeal to common grace and two commonly held philosophical statements of that day. And the first one is, in him we live and move and exist. And the second one is, for we are his children. That first quote uh, comes from the Greek poet Epimendes, from Crete in 600 BC. And the second poem is an allusion to a statement by another Stoic poem, a uh, poet, uh, Aratus. Now, Paul is not endorsing these philosophies. Rather, Paul is taking familiar quotes, just like he took this unknown God concept, that his pagan audience would have understood in order to highlight both the arbitrary both the absurdity of idols and the personal fatherly care of God. Paul argues that if men and women are living beings, and we are, and we are made after these gods, then whatever created us must also be living. The creator cannot be the creator or creators as they believe we were made from, cannot just be stone or wood that is lifeless. For us to have life and breath means whatever created us must have that life and breath to give us. That's just logical. And there's only one who fits that criterion. It's this God whom Paul is speaking of, this unknown God they don't know about. He is a living being. He is not a man-made object of wood or stone of a painting. And he is near, close, and he desires you seek him just like a child would seek to find his dad when he's lost him. You see, the point is God is not a dead piece of wood or stone that has no life in him. He is alive and he is living. And because he is, that is the reason we live and we move, and we have our being. It's just simple logic. And because it's just simple, God desires relationship with them, those whom he has created. He wants us to seek him, and he wants us to find him as father. So God is our creator and our father. You are his creation and you are his offspring. He has purposed everything in your life so that you would seek him in order that you would find him. And if you have not found him, it's because you're not looking for him. For he is near and he has set up your life so that you would actually seek and find him. In other words, we're completely lost in a world where we're not seeking God and his will. You may think that your life is under control, but it's actually under God's control. And he is working for the purpose that you seek him. Are you? 
It's the only, he is the only place, the only person for which can give your life purpose because he's your creator and he wants you to know him as father. Now, Paul could have stopped there and all that would have been true. Everybody in that room, the Areopagus, would have been just fine with all of that. These two truths of God as creator and father are comfortable and they are comforting truths. Sort of like a warm fuzzy inside that God is my creator and God loves me. This is not where Paul stops, though those things are true. Because there's something very significant that's also true about God, and that is that God is our judge. Verses 30 and 31. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to all to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Times of ignorance. This is what Paul calls all of history up to this point. Outside of Israel, Gentiles lived in ignorance of the true God. And so God in his mercy didn't always intervene with special temporal judgment, although ignorance is not an excuse for to do whatever sin they wanted. But now, now, as Paul is saying, all excuses are gone. Now that Christ has appeared, now that he has died and rose again, and that the gospel is fully known in him, ignorance is no longer an excuse to remain in your sins. The light has come into the darkness. Christ has revealed the Father in himself and has revealed the way of salvation in him. And now you must act. Now you must respond. Now you must repent. Repent in Greek, metanoio, literally means to think after, and it implies a change of mind that results in a full change of life. As Paul is using it here, it is a turn from the lifeless idols that they're worshiping to the true and living God. This unknown God is no longer unknown to you. He is the creator, and you should turn from your ways of false worship and acknowledge his sole lordship of heaven and earth. To not do so is to bring judgment upon yourself. And here we have the importance of the resurrection of Christ. It was accomplished as proof that God is coming one day to judge the world in righteousness through Christ. Yes, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead brought about the forgiveness of sins for all who believe in him. Yes, the resurrection of Jesus affirms that our faith is legitimate, but it is also true that the resurrection of Jesus proves that God is judge of all creation and that his righteous judgment is still coming. When we look at the specifics here, we see that this is a true statement. First, we see that God's judgment day is a fixed day in verse 31, meaning there is a specific day on God's calendar that has already been circled and set. It's an appointed day, especially designed for one purpose, and that is righteous judgment. God as your creator, as your father, also means he's your judge. And this is not a manipulative scare tactic to control you. This is simply a reality that needs to be known. It's just as much a reality as you currently live and move and have your being in him. This last week, we probably all saw the um, massive accident in Baltimore where the Francis Scott Key Bridge was hit by a cargo ship and completely collapsed. 
a 1.6 mile long bridge gone. And even though there were a few construction workers on that bridge, that bridge filling potholes, and I do know a few of them died, and I know at least one's in critical condition, the amazing thing is that there was no cars on that bridge. Why not? Well, the reason was is because the cargo ship had called the port to say they were having electrical issues. The port called the police, and the police blocked the bridge to keep anybody from driving across because of the potential danger that was coming. Now I ask, was it rude and manipulative for the police to stop drivers from driving on the bridge, knowing that there was danger ahead of them if they kept going? Of course it wasn't. It was absolutely the right thing to do. In fact, it was a gracious and loving act to warn of that danger. And the same thing is true here. God has been clear throughout the Bible that there is a fixed day in which he will judge the world and that the only way out of that judgment is repentance. It is a fixed day. It is coming. And it's right to warn. We also note in verse 31 that this is a comprehensive day. His judgment's comprehensive. God is coming to, the, to, the, to judge the world. Not a few people, not some people, not most people, God will judge the whole world in righteousness. You, me, everyone you've ever known or met, no one is exempt. Matthew 5, uh, 25, uh, Jesus said it this way, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him for judgment. So it's a fixed day. It's a comprehensive day. Thirdly, God's judgment, it will be a righteous day. He will judge in righteousness. God's judgment will be just, right, fair, equitable. This will not be according to democracy or the ever-changing cultural norms, but God will judge according to his perfect, holy character. He will be the standard in which he measures all people. There will be no curve. Uh, there will be no comparing of other people as if you're better than someone else. Perfect justice, perfect fairness will reign without even the slightest injustice or impartiality. Psalm 98, 9, before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. So it's a fixed day. It's a comprehensive day. It's a righteous day. And finally, it is Jesus' day. He will judge the world in righteousness through, whom, through a man whom he has appointed, which is his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus stated this fact during his ministry in John 5, for not even the father judges anyone, but he, the father, has given all judgment to the son so that all will honor the son even as they have honored the father. The apostles of Jesus preached this as well. In Acts chapter 10, verse 42, Peter says of his commission from Jesus that he commanded us to preach to all the people to testify that he, Jesus, is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Romans 2.16, Paul also writes, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. I mean, do you understand what, what Paul is saying here? God is the creator and therefore the judge of all. And he is coming on a fixed day on his calendar to judge the world for their sin, for their stiff arming of him in their sin. 
and it will be perfect justice and one like we've never seen because every single offense and sin that is against God, will, he will mite out punishment righteously. And for those who have not repented, it will be unto eternal destruction. 2 Thessalonians 1, for, for after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, these he will pay in the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Looking again at Matthew 25, Jesus went on. After he says all the nations will be gathered before him, he will separate one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire. And these will go away into eternal punishment and the righteous into eternal life. This is the reality of every person who is not right with God, who does not seek God so as to find him as he has revealed himself. This judgment is unto eternal fire, and it will be yours because of your life of sin. God is only just and only holy, and he will be just with your life, and he will find you guilty and send you to eternal punishment unless you repent. That is why Paul says this here. This is the only way to avoid judgment unto eternal hell is to repent, turn away from your life of sin, your gods, your idolatry away from God. Turn to him, seek him, follow him, and you will be saved. How do we know this will happen? Well, that's the whole point of the resurrection. Having furnished proof by all men, to all men by raising Jesus from the dead. The resurrection of Christ proves that judgment is coming and it will come from Jesus. And note how Paul phrases all of this. Furnished proof. It's adequate. That is, it's enough. A proof to all men. It's available. It's for everyone. In other words, again, you can't say you didn't know that the coming judgment of God was coming. You cannot say you were not warned because you have been. And the resurrection of Jesus is your warning. It's a witness to all men, to you and to me. And so the question is, what will you do. God is the preacher, and he is declaring to you that you should repent. That is your saving grace. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return to the Lord, and the Lord will have compassion on him he will abundantly pardon. To round out this story, we, we get a couple of responses here that don't need a lot of explanation because they're pretty clear. And I'll just call this point, God is our savior because he does save. That's what he promises to do and we get to see that right here. Verse 32, now when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, oh, we'll hear you more about that. We'll hear you about uh, again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed, and among whom were Dionysius, the Aragite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. Again, there's only one of two responses to the gospel. Whether or not you've heard it a thousand times from many different pulpits, the gospel is still the same, and you only have one of two responses that God is your creator and your father who cares for you and a judge who's coming, that you either believe or you do not. 
Belief is the other side of the coin to repentance. True faith is a repentant faith and a believing faith. Repenting from your sin, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as the only Savior from your sins. Repentance and belief, that's true faith. And that's what they mean here by some men joined him and believed. They believed. That's what we see here. They heard, and now they follow Jesus. They repent, they leave their old ways, and they rest their souls in the saving work of Christ at the cross and in his resurrection. But sadly, there are those, verse 32, who do not believe. This is the heart of sneering, of listening to the message of the gospel, hearing its invitation to repent, and scoffing at it, at how ridiculous it sounds. But only one saves. God has made that clear. So what will be your response? God is a savior from the wrath to come. Will you repent from your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Or will you continue to sneer at this message, continue in your sins all the while, ignoring the proof that the resurrection offers, and that is coming just judgment. I pray that you will hear and surrender all to him. You will not harden your hearts because Jesus was delivered over for our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Let me pray. Father, grateful for the time we have together in your word. Thank you for how clear it is. Thank you for the accuracy we can trust it with because it's yours. Oh God, you are the creator and you desire us to seek you so that we may know you, so that we may be saved by you. Our biggest problem is not the things of this world, not politics. It's not even the cultural stuff that's going on. Rather, Lord, the biggest problem is our sin our offense against you, our wickedness. And we deserve just judgment from you, and yet you've made a way by your grace to save us from that just judgment. And that came through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And all we have to do is respond with true faith, which is repentance and belief in him. I pray, Lord, you would cause hearts to be not sneering at this message. The message of the gospel. The message that you are declaring that they should repent. Open their eyes, O oh Lord. Change their hearts. And, those, and Lord, for those of us who are saved, who have repented and believed, would we remember every day both that your judgment is coming and get the word out of the gospel because that's what will save. But that we would also live by the resurrection knowing that we are saved because of what you did in raising Christ from the dead. Oh, how thankful we are, oh Lord, for that new life and the resurrected life that is promised to come. Cause us to live in light of it, Lord, every day for the sake of others, for the sake of you, your glory and our good. Pray in Christ's name. Amen.